Hello, I'm Dr. Alegria Rivadeneira. I am co-PI at a grant for OER in Colorado State University, Pueblo in Colorado. And today we are celebrating Open Education Week with uh, some explorations on how to get started with OER. At the end of this presentation, I will share the link to my presentation, which is an open educational resource. So you all have access to what I will be showing you today. So the first thing I'm gonna do is thank uh, the people who are attending today uh, for coming over and helping me generate some good ideas. And I will be sharing this presentation with all of you, as I said, after the presentation is done. So the presentation today is called How to Become an OER Hero, because anybody who embarks on something like this is a hero in my mind. And this presentation itself is an OER. That is, it's a learning resource that you will have access to through a link. And uh, the first page will be an index where you can actually click and it will take you to the different slides of things you may wanna find out. What is OER? Why would you wanna build OER? Where, and, uh, where to start and where to find other OER that you can maybe adopt or adapt? Um, we'll talk about publishing platforms, accessibility, which is something that scares people a little bit because we want to make sure that we do our OER accessible, copyright, fair use, and CC licenses, which is actually the scariest one because always we're afraid that we are going to uh, use something that maybe we weren't allowed to. So we'll talk a little bit about that, how you would pick a license for when you put together your resource how you would give attribution to those that you use or how other people who use your stuff can give you attribution, where to find pictures. People always want to know where to find pictures. And last but not least, um, things to think about as you put things together. So are we ready to start? I hope we are. So the big first question is what is OER? because we hear this a lot. And it just stands for Open Educational Resource. And they're resources used in education that live in the public domain or have been released with an open license. And it allows whomever is using it to use it, adapt it, redistribute it uh, with a few or no restrictions. And they are free of cost, which is something that is wonderful, especially when we're thinking about our students. So a lot of people ask me, so do I have to write a book to write an OER? But you don't because OER is a resource. So that can be anything. It comes in many shapes and sizes. So um, people think of a book, but resources can be anything that you would use for education and that you want to license as open. So for example, a bank of test questions, worksheets, process sheets, booklets, single lessons on a topic, recordings, videos, even if you write a song and then you want everybody else to use it without having to pay you royalties, <laughs> or even a handout or a drawing, anything that you are using for educational pr uh, purposes and you want to allow others to use as well without breaking copyright. Here are a couple examples I wanted to give you. So here is a drawing I made of the um, narrative arc. There wasn't anything in Spanish, so I drew it. Now I am uploading this into the OER Commons, and anybody looking for this in Spanish can use it as long as they write this little thing down here. This image, Partes de una Narración by Alegría Rivadeneira, is licensed CC by and CSA. And I'll tell you what that means here in a minute. So it's just a drawing. I already did an OER. Or it could be a handout. I wanted to show you this one. I used to write this policy about plagiarism in my class. And I thought, you know, other people might be able to benefit from this. So I wrote it a little prettier with learning objectives, a little conversation to have before they read it, and then little paragraphs about it, little discussion questions. What makes it an OER? This right here. At the end, I wrote this license that says, this work is by me and is licensed by a Creative Commons license. This means that if I give it to Yvonne or to Kim or to Alex, they can use it 
and just say, this came from Alegria Rivadeneira. But they are not breaking any copyrights. When we write something, every time we write it, if we don't say it's an open license, it is automatically copywritten. I know that a lot of people like to write copyright 2020 or whatever it may be. But the reality is as soon as you finish a product and you put it out there into the world, it is de facto copywritten. So unless you put a CC license, it, anybody using your stuff is stealing it. And they could get in trouble if you decided to pursue it. Most of us don't. There are some exceptions called fair use, and I will tell you about them a little bit more. So let's share this, and you can do this in the chat. Have you ever created a learning resource for your students? Not a CC license, just have you ever written anything uh, yourself, a process sheet, a little handout, something for your students to, um, to read and learn something in your class? And have you ever shared something that you created with another instructor? And how did that go? So let me know in the chat if you've done any of these things before. Um, I know, for example, that before I knew about OER, I was writing all kinds of things and giving them to my students and sharing them with my friends. But I didn't know that my stuff was copywritten and by them using it, I was giving them permission, which was okay. But then if somebody else used it without permission, they would be in trouble. <laughs> oh, thank you, Yvonne. I had fun making that drawing. But yes, proposals, outlines, PowerPoints. Uh, Kim has done interactive presentations, right? So all these things are things we have produced. They are under our copyright. Other people are not supposed to use them without our permission. But if we want to put them out there for others to use because we want to share, then we can put a CC license on it already. So why would we want to create OER? Why would we want to create a, a resource? Well, the big books especially, well, they save our students money, right? Because they don't have to buy those expensive books like Alex was telling us earlier with the psychology books. Also, uh, we as creators can create mix and match content that addresses our students' needs and lived experiences. So that can be fantastic. And then we can promote equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I will show you, for example, a bank of pictures that are uh, pictures that don't usually come up on, on uh, Google slides, uh, Google searches. Like for example, when you search for baby, you get white babies. <laughs> So you have to make a real effort to get a brown baby, uh, you know. So there are even image banks that we can use to include more diversity, even visually, in our in our products. Of course, you also probably want to contribute to your discipline. You feel passionate about your field, and you want uh, these things to be heard, and you want to share. And this is why I think anybody who does an OER, be it a little picture or a huge textbook, is an OER hero. But one of the things that scares us is where to start. So these are some of my pointers on how to get started. First, look at OERs in your discipline to get inspired. See what people are putting out there. You might be surprised on how simple some of them are and then how um, uh, elaborate some others are. And maybe you fall somewhere in the middle. Then talk to someone who has made OERs because they can probably give you some good ideas. Also, find out if your school has support for you, both financial and technology, because some people are better with technology, others are not. So if you need support on that, you want to know somebody's going to help you and be in your corner. And also find your community, find other people who are doing it, come together with them and share stories and ideas. Finally, you probably also want to think about a publishing platform. But let's go back to the first one. Look at OERs in your discipline and get inspired. In this learning resource, which I will be sharing with you, that is a learning resource and a slide presentation, um, you have this little link here. So when you click here, it takes you to this place that says places to find OER. I particularly like Oasis. So let me just show you very quickly how that would look. I would go into Oasis and somebody here is in communication. So I'm going to do a search on communication in OASIS. And wow, there's books, there's modules, there's learning objects, 
there's course materials. And let's say I want pure communication studies. Oh yeah, that looks fantastic, right? So I'm gonna go communication studies. And once I click on that, oh, it says there is actually 10 textbooks on communication studies. And wow, look at this organizational communication message processing. Wow, this is so interesting. Trends in digital and ooh, visual communication. Let's look at what that OER looks like. Somebody's put this out in Granite College. And it is on a platform, you will see it, it's called Pressbooks, this platform. And here it is, look, oh, introduction to visual communications, deconstructing visual media. Oh, let's say you just thought, I can use this little piece in my class. Guess what? You can. You can take this, copy paste it into your own document or send your students to this link and you are effectively already using an OER in your class. It is that easy. So here is our little searchable tool. You'll probably have some fun doing that. But a lot of people get a little scared when they hear a publishing platform. You just saw one. The one I told you is called Pressbooks. And it's basically like making a web page, but made especially for books that are OER. So why you want a publishing platform? Because one of the um, things that has to happen with OER is it needs to be something that you share publicly, that people have access to outside of just your students, so the general public. So it needs to uh, generate a link. And there are these nice platforms that are very, very fancy, like Pressbooks. There's another one, uh, a, web paging, a, a web page building uh, program called WebPress. There are EdTech books. And Manifold are just four examples of um, platforms where you can build your OER. And a lot of people sometimes get intimidated. I know I was intimidated at first about this. So a lot of us go, wait, wait, I'm not techie. I don't, I don't know how to do this, but it's okay. I want you to take a breath and think it just needs to be in a shareable form. It needs to generate a link. So when you're thinking about how you're going to do that, first, you can look at what kind of help your school offers, maybe something that you can start small, it doesn't need to be a fancy press books book, or ask yourself, do you know how to use Google Drive or any other cloud based drive where documents generate links, because if you do, guess what, you could make it that simple, and I'm going to show you an example right now. Here is one that I am doing for one of my books. Um, I'm also creating it in a more fancy format, but I wanted to show you. This is a Google Doc. It has my license. It has a pretty picture I made, which, by the way, I'm saying how it got made and whose pictures I'm, where I'm using to make this picture, because that's the nice etiquette. And then this is my resource right here. It's just a Google Doc that then generates um, links to other Google Docs that have the information as simple as that. So when my students click on this, then they will go to the page that talks about narration. And here is the funny drawing and everything else. My point being that you don't even need a fancy platform. If you can work on um, Google Docs, you can create quite a fancy OER that generates a link. All I will need to do is give my students this primary link, and then they will have access to all the content as I build it. Whoa, right? Who would have thought it could be that easy? Well, I am here to tell you it is, so you do not need to be intimidated by that. Let's say you have a collection of resources and you could put all those collections in one index page and now it is publicly shareable. Something else that we do have to think when we are doing OER is accessibility. That is, for example, does a student who is visually impaired and would need really good color contrast, can, can she read what I did? If I have a student who absolutely cannot see, could she use a screen reader to read my resource? Wow, you know, this is something we don't think about too often. And I know that even old textbooks didn't used to have that. And they would hire people. I know um, Alex was a reader 
for uh, people who needed readers of textbooks back in the day. So back then we just had uh, student workers who would read the textbooks to other students. But now we also have screen readers. So we wanna make sure that what we do uh, it follows some accessibility codes. Here is a toolkit where you will be able to link. And when it opens up, it has probably a lot more than you ever wanted to know but it talks about what is assistive technology, the diversity in your audience, creating accessible digital content. So that is something that you can come back and revisit when you are ready to look at it. For now, I just want you to keep in the back of your head that accessibility is something you want to integrate into your OER. And I wanna tell you something very neat, which is that Google Docs already come with accessibility built in. That is Google Docs, do have readers and you can just let it know if you are writing in English or in Spanish and it will read it to somebody else. So um, I'm a big fan of creating very simple OER in Google Docs because it comes with accessibility and it's just so, so easy for everybody to use and update and add and change and do everything that we want to do. So let's say that you've decided to write a textbook or as I would call it, a collection of resources. And um, the reason I wanna say that is because for example, this book that I'm writing that I had shown you is really a group of units. So these, each one of these can be used individually. If somebody wants to uh, tell a student how to write a narration, they don't have to read this whole book. They can just give them this little unit. So in a way, this is a collection of resources that I am created more than a book that follows a linear fashion. But say, let's say then that you wanna create something, a, a larger project, a textbook, a collection of resources. So the first thing you wanna do is look at your current textbook or whatever it is that you're using to give students input and think, well, what makes this resource good and what makes it not so good? You know, maybe it's outdated. Maybe the examples are old. Maybe it shows no diversity in points of view or the images are all, uh, <laughs> all of a certain group of people. And you know, so you're thinking, no, I, I, I want to at least update the images or something different. Uh, a lot of times when we're using textbooks, this is what happens. We go like, oh, I like this textbook, but I would change this. I would change that. <gasps> Guess what? You can probably do it. Then you can imagine your book or resources. What pieces would it have? And what would be your pedagogical approach? You, are you more of a hands-on person? Would you put a lot of project-based learning in there? Or are you more of a lecture person? Would you put a lot of TED Talks in there? Or do you like a combination? These would be pedagogical approaches that you could manipulate and put into um, your resource uh, as, as, as you see fit and whatever you think your students need. And then probably your third step would be to create a rough outline, right? And again, this little thing started as an outline. This is an outline and now I'm just filling in the blanks. All right, so now I would like to hear what books and resources are you using right now in your classes? And what do you like about them? And what do you wish was different in, in your resources? Let me see And You can just drop that in the chat so I can get an idea of uh, what it is that you would be changing or, or doing. And as you do that, I'm gonna tell you just a little story about uh, one of the resources I'm writing right now. Um, it was written by a really good friend of mine as a commercial textbook. And now uh, I was asking her about it and she told me she doesn't use it. She doesn't use her own textbook and she's just taken apart little pieces of what she wrote as a commercial textbook and she has made it available to her students um, in little pieces. So yeah, I see, yes. Yeah, so we have, we have um, the OER for speaking and listening, right? and it has exercises. Wow, yeah, more applied, right? Yvonne, this is a perfect example. So you have a book that is mostly input, but you'd like to make your students more active learners. So you could even continue to use that book and just add 
the work part of it, right? Just like the, the actual action items for them. So that's an excellent example. Thank you for sharing that. So let's say that you've now created your outline, all the things that you would want. Well, probably you want to go out and look at OER to see what is already out there and see what you could piece together. I call that Frankensteining, you know, it's like, oh, I like this little piece on visual narratives. Oh, I like this little piece somebody else did about something else. And you can just beep, 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 grab, grab, grab different things. You make sure you give attribution, but if they have a CC license, you can use them without it being stealing. So you can think, are there any useful pieces that you can take? and check their CC license. So I'm gonna stop here for a second and just um, address what is a CC license. And you will have this link on the resource so you can go and look at them. So CC licenses, it brings you to this page is the Creative Commons page. And it tells you all these little funny drawings and what they mean. For example, this one means anybody can use the stuff I do and use it however they like even to make money out of it. And all they have to do is give me attribution. In other words, say that I was the original creator. This other one down here I, is a very interesting one to me. This one says, I'm giving this an open license. Anybody can use all of it, pieces of it, what uh, translated to another language. You can do whatever you want. But when you have your product, you cannot make money out of it no money making. So that's a different one, right? Here's the one that I like to use just because I figure if I want it to be free, I want anything that comes out of the stuff I did, I want it to be free too. And that is, it's an open license, a CC license. You have to give me attribution. That's what the little person means. You cannot make money out of it because if I'm giving it for free, you better give it for free. And the last one is share alike. And that means when you share it, when you share your new product, you have to share under the same license, which means you'll have to make it open for others to use. You cannot make money and then they have to share it alike. <laughs> and then there's some others and you can take your own time in um, exploring these as well. But there's another group of things that people can use. And those are materials that you may want to use that don't have an open license. Oh, and then how do you use them without stealing? Well, first, they're the ones who might, which might not be under copyright protection. You know, when we put something out into the world, it is immediately copywritten. However, after a certain amount of years, the copyright expires and then it belongs to the people. Hmm? Is part of everybody's uh, uh, possessions. This gets really tricky. You know, a lot of Disney characters are reaching the, the copyright uh, moment where then they will become everybody else's. So we'll see how that happens. But stuff that is from a really, really long time ago is probably already in the public domain. The public domain is stuff that the copyright already expired because it's really old. So that's one. The second one, things that are newer, could fall under fair use. I'm not going to go into fair use a whole lot, but I've given you a link. When you open fair use here, it takes you to this great resource that shows you the different uses of um, that fall under fair use. Education is very often fair use. That is, if something was produced for one um, for one. Uh, with, with an aim in mind, and then you take it and use it for education, a little part of it, then it might fall under fair use. And uh, it, this, is a, this is something that whenever you speak with the lawyers, and I'm certainly not one, you know, they make sure that they explain to you that there are reasons why you can use it. For example, for illustrative purposes. If you want to talk about the Mona Lisa, which is actually probably now in the public domain, but if you want to talk about the Mona Lisa and you put the Mona Lisa's pictures there and you want your students to analyze the Mona Lisa, then this is the image that you have to use. It is for educational purposes. 
and you are and there is no other image that, that you could use because the educational purpose of it is that people learn about the Mona Lisa and analyze it. So these are ways that we can um, tackle fair use in education. This is a huge field. I'm not going to get into it, but you do have the resource and um, we can always talk about it more if this is something that you are concerned with. So let's say now that you have all the pieces in your head, you know how you're going to do this, um, or you think you know. So the first thing you want to do is you want to refine your outline. So just have all your outline ready so you can make sure that you're not going crazy because um, we were talking about this earlier, right? That a lot of times it's just overwhelming all of a sudden. <laughs> the world is my oyster and I could write a million books about this, right? So refining it and taming the beast becomes really, really important. The second thing is creating a very well organized file folder to hold everything that is going to go into your OER, images, text, um, PowerPoints, anything that you're going to use and organize it really well. So your original writings, if you're borrowing things from other people, bring them into that drive, keep everything together well marked. Um, other pieces that you can use, images, anything else, you just keep it all in one place. I am telling you this from experience because oh, it's so hard to find afterwards. And then if you're using anything with a CC license, that is with the open license we were talking about, you want to make sure you tassel. What does tassel mean? Tassel means that you are citing the title, the author, the source and the license. For example, if I put this picture in my book or if I put it on my PowerPoint and it has a CC license on it, underneath it, I should write Fruglin Afterglow by Lucas Schlagenoff is licensed under CC by ND. Where do you find this? Usually when you go to the image repositories, you can get this information and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. But this is what you want to do. You want to give attribution. This is to a picture. But if you're using somebody else's book, then you would say sections of this book have been used in my chapter. The book by so-and-so called such and such under such and such license. So you want to make sure you're giving attribution. That is the only thing that people uh, who do OER uh, are asking you to do. And then when you have your own OER, you'll be asking others as well to give you attribution and say, nice, Kim Pluskota created this for me and I want to make sure I give her attribution. And that is the way that the system works. All right, so now let's say that you are creating some original material, things that came out of your mind, like that little drawing that I used that I made. Well, you have to know that if you put a CC license on it, you are giving others the right to use it, adopt it and adapt it. So if somebody wanted to scratch out the little girl and put an alien uh, uh, insect in there, they could do that. I'm giving them permission to do that. Hmm? Uh, you wanna make sure that the format, uh, when you use the format, if especially if it's written, there's something that it can be easily transferable. So when you're using something like Word or Google Docs, you want to use headings, subheadings, clean text, so then it transfers better <laughs> and also have backups because you don't want to lose any of your stuff. So these are things that you want to be thinking when you're creating your own materials. Now let's talk about something that people really like to talk about, which is using pictures. Most of us go online and we just kind of copy images and put them on our slides. We put them um, on handouts for our students. And, uh, you know, sometimes just to make it pretty, not with an illustrative purpose, like the Mona Lisa I was talking about earlier. And so uh, we just do that, you know, just for the prettiness of the presentation. But we don't know if those um, images have a CC license. If they don't, they are probably copywritten and we don't want to steal, right? So um, a responsible uh, OER thinking person makes sure to use only images that are either in the public domain, have a CC license, or are part of fair use. Where do we find these magical images? Well, 
first of all, a lot of people just go into Google, search under images. I don't know if you all have done this, but let's just do this. I'm just going to say baby. <laughs> and I am going to say images. And now you see all the white babies I was telling you. Oh, oh nice. OK, so here is baby. But I can't just use any of these. Most of these are probably copywritten. So I go into tools, sorry, this is in Spanish, herramientas and usage rights, derechos de uso, and then you go to Creative Commons. So this is going to filter Google to the pictures that actually have a Creative Commons license. This is probably the easiest way, but sometimes some of these um, are still not fully licensable. So I am going to give you, in my opinion, something that is even better. And that is on slide number 18 <laughs> of your resource. And these are places that hold images that are royalty free or part of Creative Commons. So uh, you can go in straight into a Creative Commons image search, and then you know that everything that is in there is Creative Commons. Also in this uh, group of search engines or uh, resources, I have included the third one here, diversity and inclusion collections. I created this resource, which by the way, is also an openly licensed resource. So you can use it in your classes if you want to give it to your own students um, with uh, links to other types of photography that address diversity and inclusion. For example, disabled and here. This is a group of photographs that you can use and you can um, uh, browse through to see what you would want to use in your classes or in your textbooks uh, in order to be using images that are free of copyright, are part of the uh, Creative Commons, and um, also uh, in do a little more diversity and inclusion into our own textbooks. So this you have here, you can have a great time doing it. Um, the first four, the first three, usually you have to auth uh, cite the authors. Things like Unsplash, Pixabay, Pexel, and Flickr, uh, they don't even ask you to acknowledge the, the authors, though I think it's nice to do that, even if they don't ask to be acknowledged. So let's say now you've put something together, you have your images, and then you're trying to decide how you want to share. Remember those little licenses that I was talking about? So when you're thinking about these licenses, you can think about how you want to share them. And well, there's several ways that you can do it. And here at the bottom, it's a tool that helps you decide. So I'm just going to show you the tool. It's pretty cool. Um, it's on beta right now. But here it tells you, do you know which license you want to use? Let's say I say, yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> Next. Do you know, do you want to be attributed for your work? You know, there's people who ask not to, and you say, yes, I do. And you hit next. Do you want other people to use it commercially? No, I don't. And then see over here, it starts telling you how you want to do it. So this is a great little tool to pick your license. So now we're getting towards the end. As you're putting all of this together, this is what I recommend that you do. First of all, keep track of all the information from borrowed materials so you can give attribution. So whether it's uh, pieces of other textbooks, whether it's pictures that you've pulled in, uh, whether it's um, uh, a, a piece of music, anything that you may be using, make sure that you keep good records because you would be surprised how hard it is to remember where you got that picture after you um, forgot to, to share where it came from at the beginning or to record, and it has happened to me. So I tell you, it's no fun, keep good records. Then if you're with a team, if you're doing this with a team, make sure that you make use of all your, all everybody's talents because everybody can um, has these abilities that you can use. Some people are better at designing, others are better at researching. So if it's a team effort, you definitely wanna make sure you're using everybody's um, abilities. Now, 
The third one I like, know that it doesn't have to be perfect. It can evolve over time. So don't be intimidated. You can make something very simple and then continue to make it more fancy as you reiterate and reiterate. But you don't have to wait until it's perfect to put a CC license on it and uh, put it in the Creative Commons. Now, the fourth one, enlist people as readers to check the user experience side of things. So if you already have something, maybe give it to a friend and have them navigate around because it may be clear to you, but maybe not to other people. So that's always nice to have a second pair of eyes. The next one, create a timeline for yourself with benchmarks so you can celebrate your project, especially if you're embarking on a really long project, you definitely want to have some benchmarks so you can go like, oh, I reached the 10 first units I wanted to reach. Oh, I am going to pat myself in the back. Because with long projects, it can be really hard to maintain momentum. And then when it gets hard, think about how you're making the world a better place with your contribution. Because this is probably what drives most of us to produce OER. And last but not least, have fun. Have fun because you get to be creative and you get to do something that you think can benefit others. So that, that it doesn't get more fun than that. So my call to you is to dare to be an OER hero.